Thank you so much for coming out. It is great to see the uh, participation and the interest from our community in, in what we're doing in the fire district. Um, as we know, wildfire and mitigation is top priority. It's our, our biggest hazard in our communities. Um, and that is not as emphasized by the fire we just had uh, Sunday into yesterday in the West Ranch area. Um, so just because it's December, the calendar means nothing. We are still in, in fire danger and, and all that good stuff. So we've got a lot of stuff to present tonight. Uh, I'm going to start off with some introductions. My name is John Mandel. I'm with the Canyon Fire Protection District. I'm the wildland captain. Uh, I've been there for 22 years now. Um, I am the, the guy who coordinates all of our wildland response and uh, things like this, the, the Community Wildfire Protection Plan. So this has been a, a long work in progress for a little over a year now. I have to say it's been a pleasure working with uh, the Ember Alliance, and you'll meet, meet these folks here in a minute. Um, but um, I, I will also say that I'm, I'm pretty proud of the product that, that we're presenting to you tonight. And uh, hopefully you'll see the, uh, the value of this uh, for the community and, and what we can do with it to mitigate things in the future. So without further ado, we're going to go through introductions. We'll start with the fire folks, and then we'll, we'll jump into Ember Alliance. Good evening. Skip Sherlaw, Chief of Inner Canyon. Good evening, everyone. My name is Benjamin Yellen. I'm the Wildland Captain in Elk Creek. Um, as you can see, it's the Elk Creek Inner Canyon uh, CWPP, so we're working with John for the past about uh, year and a half. So appreciate y'all coming. I'm Kelly McConaughey. I am with both Inner Canyon and Elk Creek as the Wildland uh, Mitigation Specialist. Hi, my name is Meg Matonis, and I'm a wildfire behavior analyst for the Upper Alliance, and I've been an on-call firefighter for the Larimer County Sheriff's Office um, for seven years, and I have a uh, PhD in um, forestry. Hello, everyone. I am Karina Marshall. I am a project manager with the Ember Alliance, and um, yeah, really excited to kind of be at the final stage with this CWPP, so I'll get up here um, and talk a little bit for a while about um, what we're doing here and um, give you a little overview and context. There will be a lot of time for questions today, um, so um, we're kind of talking through some of the introductions, getting you know some time for everyone to settle in. If you haven't already, please make sure you scan the QR code so that we can register your participation. It's also an awesome resource once you go through that, so please sign in that way. And then we're going to go through a bit of the CWPP overview. Some of you might be very familiar with what that is, some people not so much. So we'll give a background for everyone. And then we're going to dive into um, what actually went into the CWPP. What did we do and what were the results? And then how, what, what kind of things does that tell us? How are we going to use that information? Um, after we talk a little bit about what you can do and what it means and what types of things you and the audience can do versus land managers in the area, we'll kick it over to Elk Creek and Inner Canyon Fire Protection Districts to talk a bit about the community programs that they have here, which will be great resources for you to take action. Um, and then talk a little bit about why this was done between the two districts, and a little bit about what's to come for the, for the merge. And then we're going to invite some of our partners up who've been participating, um, other land managers in the area, and we will uh, be able to answer some questions for you. We've scheduled a lot of time. I'm sure you all have lots of things that are on your mind about wildfire in your community, so we want to allow a lot of time for questions about that. CWPP and other things in that realm. So we've brought a lot of experts here today to make sure we can answer those questions. And then I'll give you a few next steps at the end. So um, hopefully we'll kind of keep it to 8 p.m. here. Um, and we're really excited for all of you to join us. So 
um, the, the three things that we're trying to do here today are um, making sure that everyone understands what the CWPP is, discussing the risks that exist in your community, uh, and then really number three is the big one. What can you do about those risks and what is your responsibility to bring forward and what's going to be happening um, moving forward after this CWPP is complete. So I want to just give you a little orientation because I stare at these maps all the time, and we all do, but you all probably don't think of this outline very much. So in blue here is the Elk Creek Fire Protection District. In magenta uh, or pink is the Inner Canyon Fire Protection District. We did a CWPP covering this entire area, as well as a slight boundary um, around the outside to make sure that we were capturing risks that were at, like, right outside of the district. So as you can see here, Right up in the middle where those root roads converge, I'm not quite tall enough, that's where Conifer is. Um, you can see Deer Creek Canyon here, so if you're coming through Inner Canyon, this is also Pleasant Park Road. Um, Staunton State Park is here, and then this is the Park County Jefferson County line. So hopefully that helps give you a little orientation to where we're at. Um, like I said, if you sign in with a QR code, you'll get to access a um, interactive map, which will give you a little bit more um, uh, maneuverability with these maps rather than just looking at a static where you can get into a, a finer level. All right, so CWPPs are really important, and I want to place them in context for all of you because. It's, it's not just one plan that's going to solve everything. The real hope for this community and any other community really on the front range um, is to become a fire adapted community. And that doesn't just mean CWPP, though that's under plans and regulations, and this is an important piece that touches down on a lot of these components. We really want to make sure that the community is adapted to fire so that when fire does happen, because we're all living in a fire adapted ecosystem, a fire prone ecosystem. We need to be ready for it so it's not a catastrophic event. Um, and so that includes a lot of different pieces and parts. And some of those fall to you all as the residents, and some of those fall to us as plan writers, and some of those fall to the county. There's a lot of different players that work here, but I really want to kind of zoom back and see where the CWPP fits in the midst of all of this. But a CWPP itself is really a tool and a process to determine what your priorities are. So the fire protection districts know that there's a lot of risk. I'm sure you all know there's a lot of risk too. But determining how you're going to prioritize and manage that risk and reduce it can be a really overwhelming task. So really the point of a CWPP is to take it from that big, scary thing and break it down into pieces and determine What's the highest priority? What do we actually need to do that makes a difference? And at what scale? So for us, the way that this kind of breaks down, the way that the Emerald Alliance functions, and I'm sorry, I didn't give a real, you may be wondering what the Emerald Alliance is. We're a nonprofit organization, and we do a lot of consulting work to do CWPP. So my apologies if, if that was confusing. Um, but this is our normal process. So we get data and information from the community, stakeholders, agency partners, land managers, community members, and we bring it in and we take that into our consideration. And then we do wildfire risk analysis. I'll talk a bit more about what that is and what that actually means and what we get out of that. Um, and those two things together really inform strategic priorities for risk mitigation and um, other wildfire related planning. And then it really informs where we need to prioritize resources for defensive space, home parking, and kind of neighborhood resident level mitigation. So to break that down a little bit more for you, you know, this is going to be some stuff that you maybe have not seen before or not heard of before. And all of the details are not important. Um, 
what is going to be important is the priorities and the rate risk ratings that come out of this. But I want you to have the context to understand what those mean and what they come from, so that we're not just telling you what the, the risks are. Um, so as I mentioned before, that first piece is fire behavior analysis. Um, so that's where we're taking an account of vegetation as fuel and determining how is a fire likely to behave. And then we can take that information, how is fire behaving on the landscape, and extrapolate some information out of that. What does the ember production look like? If we have really dense fuels, how far might that reach? What about radiant heat? Is that going to be a factor influencing structures? We can take a look at that. We can also map roadway fuel hazards. So where we have a lot of fuel along a roadway, a lot of vegetation, that could be causing um, hazards during evacuations, or could be, um, if mitigated, could be a good tactical option for firefighters. So um, that is one piece. And then we're also looking at evacuation hazards in order to prioritize roadway treatment. So that's kind of where we can take that next step further and extrapolate a little more info. And that all comes together where we can summarize that information by neighborhoods or what we're calling plan units, and then um, to do some prioritization throughout the district. Another piece that goes into that is um, Elk Creek and Inner Canyon drove through the district to capture other hazards that we don't have data for so that we can really get a full and holistic picture. And all that comes together to give us some risk ratings to inform priorities. So I was mentioning we're going to be able to summarize information. And I know this is a lot. We'll, we'll walk you through what this is. You don't have to uh, be able to see it in too great of detail, that um, map that you have on your phone or your computer later. We'll be able to give you much more in-depth um, look at this, but this is how we have summarized fire behavior and all of our other analyses. We're calling these plan units because these are um, areas generated by not just HOAs. Sometimes that is how it works out. These might not all be communities that you recognize, but we're looking not only at HOAs, but also the road network, trying to make sure that these make sense within the way that the roads function and not cut them off arbitrarily. We're also looking, we also designed these with watersheds in mind, so that shows topographic um, changes. Fire responds a lot to topography. So when we look at these to summarize information, this is how we can disseminate those, those results and those priorities to you. These will be ranked, and we'll talk about this even in greater detail, but I wanted to give you this and plant this in your mind that we are able to summarize all of the analyses that we've done in this way as our way to kind of provide recommendations to the community that can be acted upon. So to talk about fire behavior, um, it's really crucial to know that in your district, in any district, there's a, there's a lot of variety in the vegetation, of course, and that really influences fire behavior. And so to map and model that, um, we need to be able to take a look at the vegetation. What we can't do is we can't look at homes as a structure and how they burn because we don't know how everyone's home is constructed, of course. So this is a way to model at a big scale what fire behavior looks like based on vegetation. And uh, I'm not going to go into all of the details on this. There's a lot of depth to this. But I wanted to give you some context to understand that what we're doing when we're talking about fire behavior modeling is we're taking into account a lot of factors on the landscape. You know, elevation, slope, and fuel all influence the way that fire moves and behaves. We can predict the way that vegetation burns. We're not going to get every perfect weather condition in every day scenario um, model for every potential option, but what we can do is understand in general where are the riskiest places on the landscape. So that's what we're trying to do here. 
Um, it's really complex to try to predict how a fire is going to behave, but this is our best scientific tool um, to try to understand where our risks are on the landscape. So I hope that gives you a little context for kind of what goes into this. I'll give you one example so you can kind of have it in your mind what this looks like. One thing that we can take a look at is the type of fire that's predicted. So active crown fire is where you are expecting flames in the canopy running uncontrolled, if you've ever heard of a running crown fire. Um, it's not running in coordination with the ground. The tree canopies are just going up and it's very, very difficult to um, suppress that type of fire. We can also take a look at passive crown fire. So that's where the ground fire and the trees, the, the, excuse me, the canopy fire are connected. So this is maybe what we might call group torching, stand torching, um, still more difficult to suppress, but and uh, creates a lot of ember production, but it's kind of a different fire behavior. And then surface fire is more self-explanatory, that is fire just running along the surface of the ground and not moving up into the tree canopies. So with the fuel models that we have, where we know what the vegetation looks like, we can take a look and see under different weather conditions, these are two different weather conditions, what does the fire behavior look like on the landscape? Now I'm not going to go into the details of all these maps, they're intentionally not that big because it's really hard, it's, it's much better to get in an interpretive and interactive format, but I just want to give you guys a sense, if you haven't seen this before, that this is what we're talking about with fire behavior modeling. We have it mapped on the landscape, and then we can identify these sites of highest risk. Where we can take that next, like I said, is the Embercast and Radiant Heat. So we know that homes are primarily not lost from direct flame through a forest, but through embers landing on a home and igniting it on fire, and uh, Radiant Heat, so much heat that it will combust. So we can take a look and map this on the landscape as well. Uh, this is great science that came out of um, I think the University of Alberta um, to take a look at other fires and predict structure loss based on adjacent vegetation. So we can take a look at this and this all gets summarized by those plan units so we can start to identify where are these areas of highest priority, highest risk. As I mentioned before, Roadways are really, really important. They're not only strategic features for firefighting, uh, but they're also important evacuation routes, and they can reduce the fire behavior in a given area. So we can take a look at the vegetation and determine where, how much fire behavior, how intense is that heat going to be out along the road? We're doing this by looking at flame length. Uh, so eight feet or greater of flame length, is a really hazardous roadway condition, and we need to work on seeing how that can be mitigated. And we'll talk a little bit about roadway priorities as well. Um, in addition to roadway hazards, what we can take a look at is evacuation congestion. Um, so I want to preface this conversation by saying the only reason that we're looking at evacuation information is to prioritize roadway mitigation cutting fuels and treating fuels along roadways. We want to do that in areas where there's hazardous fuels and where there's potentially a lot of evacuation congestion. This is not at all a tool to determine what an evacuation route should be. It's not a tool to direct where people should go. It is simply a tool for planning and prioritizing roadway treatment. So I want to put that really strongly Maybe everyone can raise their hands that they agree and they understand that this is not an evacuation route generator. Okay? Yes, I see hands. <laughs> um, because we always get that question and I really want to make sure that that's clear. But this is one of the inputs that helps us prioritize roadways. And you'll see a roadway priority map at the end here. Um, and so I hope that gives you the context for what this looks like in a spatial or a mapping context where we're able to take a look at all of this information 
and pull it into a prioritization. This is all going to be information available in the CWPP and available on the story map. So that's why I'm not going into a great amount of detail on every single map and analysis that we've done, but I want to make sure that everyone has context to understand what they're looking at when, when we do have that information in front of you. So as I mentioned, and I really want to hit this point home, there's three sets of priorities that we have created um, with this CWPP. There's plan units, there's priority stands, so where on the landscape should we be doing fuel treatment? It's not just where is the most hazardous fuel, but where is hazardous fuel adjacent to community, and so it needs to be treated to protect that community. And then roadside fuel treatments. So those are the three kind of results of this CWPP, is understanding which neighborhoods, which plan units need to be, um, you know, getting the most uh, work done, and then where on the landscape or along the roadways should we be treating. So I'm going to go through this. I again know that this is a lot to look at, but I'm, I promise you will break it down. You'll see in the darkest color, those are first priority watersheds. So we're able to summarize fire behavior information by a small sub watershed. The important piece here is that we get to see where on the landscape there's hazardous fuels that poses a lot of risk to the community. So this is the result of kind of interpreting the uh, fire behavior information and the risks to homes and roadways, or I'm sorry, communities, um, at, a, at a big bird's eye view level. Some of this, some of these priorities, a lot of these priority lands, watersheds, fall on private property. And that is a difficult challenge. And this is where we're thinking at that bird's eye view. How can this community and partners and land managers work together to address some of these priorities? It's gonna take some time, and it's gonna take involvement from the community and willing participation from some of the community to try to reduce some of the fuel load here and to reduce the risk. Because if risk is reduced in one place, the entire community is more safe. And I want that to be at home. At this big scale, the really important factor is that um, everyone is impacted by risks throughout the district. Even if, say, your home was safe, you still may be subject to an evacuation. There's a lot of risk in this community. I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It's a really, really high risk, extreme risk community. Um, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but it needs to happen at this scale, which is the big scale. And then I'll talk a little bit later about the smaller scale um, at, what, at which it needs to happen. This is what roadway priorities came out to be. Um, the red are the first priority roadways. Those are where we have hazardous fuel conditions along a roadway, as well as evacuation congestion concerns. So those are going to be high priority for treatment. Um, we want to improve visibility. We want to reduce the risk of fire activity along those roadways. Um, so this is kind of how this comes out. And some of these roads that have showed up as priority are not necessarily county roads. They can be, they are private roads, they are HOA roads, and this is going to take some time to disseminate through the community and try to figure out a way to do some mitigation along road sites. So what I would encourage you to do when looking at this map, though it's a really big bird's eye view and doesn't maybe feel as connected to your personal property or you personally, any roadway that's improved here is going to make everyone safer. So if everyone else is, if anyone else in your community is safe evacuating, the evacuation is going to be um, more, more safe. So we want to encourage you all to support roadside mitigation because it's, it's important for everyone in your area. And then I think maybe most um, important to you all is how we've summarized the risks by plan units. Um, I wanted to 
to put this slide back up here so you guys can kind of remember that we summarized all of the data by, uh, by these plan units so that everyone gets a risk rating. Um, so I'll show you that after this um, to give you a little context. This is a map that is produced by the U.S. Forest Service. And this risk rating is in relation to the entire country. So what this tells you is that these two fire protection districts are at extreme, extreme risk. Um, and I, you know, we have Elk Creek on the left, Inner Canyon on the right, Evergreen is above you. Um, this is a really, really high risk area. I want to put that in perspective because the next slide shows those plan units rated by risk. We have to come up with a risk rating to try to prioritize and inform um, you all on what to do next. But when I say that, it's because it's, it's not that anyone here or any neighborhood or plan unit in this area is really at a lower risk. We're just trying to um, figure out what the priorities are relative to this community. Um, I'll also note that that lower risk corner in the northwest is because that area is a lot of lodgepole pine, which is harder. Um, it doesn't burn quite as readily, but when it does, it burns um, entirely. That ecosystem is designed to to burn um, completely. So it, it's a very intense fire behavior when fire is activated there. So I wouldn't necessarily read that as a super uh, low risk area. But I guess enough to do there. Um, so these are the risk ratings for um, the community. I'm going to pass the mic over to our wildfire risk analyst, Meg Matonis. Um, to talk a little bit about what went into these ratings and um, what the differences are between the four quadrants on the left. So on the right, you can see our relative risk rating by plan unit, and like Craig was saying, areas that are moderate are less risky compared to the more extreme plan units in um, the Elk Creek and Inner Canyon Fire Protection Districts, it doesn't mean it's moderate risk compared to other parts of Colorado. So this is relative to within the Fire Protection Districts. And we have a lot of different variables that factored into this uh, composite risk assessment. And we, there's kind of four different big categories and then even additional subcategories within those big categories that all combine to come up with an overall risk. So obviously risk is very complicated. Like I was saying, there's a lot of factors that feed into fire behavior and fire risk, as well as factors that feed into the ability of firefighters to suppress fires in the wild and urban interface, and then factors that impact evacuation hazards um, and whether or not homes are going to ignite. So you can see that the relative risk in plan units can vary depending on the factor. So there's some plan units like tiny towns where their overall risk rating is moderate, but you can see that they have really high suppression challenges due to limited water sources um, and then some of the narrow roads. So the purpose of presenting an overall risk rating and then the sub-risk ratings is to help people in the different plan units identify like, what is really contributing to your overall risk. And in the CWPP document, we have descriptions for each plan unit. Um, our coworker Kenzie spent a very, very long time going through all of the data, like 20 different spreadsheets, um, to help summarize that for people to look up your plan unit. You can understand like, what is contributing to risk in your plan unit, and then what are some priority actions for you as a, a homeowner, you as a neighborhood ambassador who are trying to encourage action um, across the entire plan unit. Um, so other factors that went into, so fire risk is really heavily weighted towards areas where there's active crown fire that could be emitting 
um, groups that could ignite structures or areas that have the potential for really high flame lengths like gamble, oak, shrubland on the steep slope that could create a lot of radiant heat and ignite homes. Suppression challenges really looked at roadway accessibility and that was collected by on-the-ground observations that Ben and John made driving around um, I don't know, 75% of the roads, almost every single road. <laughs> they sent us like 800 pictures of roads from them driving around the community. Uh, some of them are pretty scary, I think I showed earlier. So that they were looking at, you know, thinking as when they were responding to an incident in an area as a wildland firefighter, would they feel safe sending a Type 3 engine down this road? Would it be a defensible space? Uh, an area where firefighters could stay and defend homes. Is there access to water for engines? Evacuation hazards looked at the evacuation modeling output and the roadway congestion that Karina showed. And then the home ignition zone hazards is based on on the ground assessment that Ben and John did, where they looked at home construction materials. So, is there higher abundance of homes that have flammable roofing materials? Siding, uh, wooden decks, and then the quality of defensible space, which Karina is going to describe what that means. So that's that's where this came from. The map that the online interactive map that we'll be presenting to you will give you a chance to like, zoom in and understand this a little bit more in detail. Yeah. I think that's worth reiterating that um, it's it's of course really hard and we can't, this is such a big area that we can't present this map at a scale that would make it easy for you to identify maybe which planning unit you live in. So that's the purpose of the story map so that you can get in and see this data more close up and take a look at where you live and some of the information that's more specific. Um, so I wanted to take a, uh, five minutes here to uh, pause for questions about the prioritization, the analyses that we did, if there's a word that we threw out that we didn't know the meaning of. Um, we're not going to talk about um, the next steps of what to do and what you can do about it. I want to take questions until the end on that because I think that will take a lot of time. Um, but just specifically about the CWPP and analysis, let's take five minutes. Yeah. Are there uh, parcels of the actual properties shown on your maps? Is it show parcels? I don't know. Uh, we could have that later. That's very important. So, uh, it's really available on the Jefferson uh, County um, data map. That's critical. Oh, yeah. yeah, we. That's really totally critical in understanding how to help with. Yeah, and I'll say, I'll say that the so the plan units. One thing I forgot to didn't mention, I don't think, is when we created the boundaries, they don't split any parcels. So each parcel will be within. Um, but I think we can talk about adding parcel layers to that map. We we use parcels to do map mapping, but not necessarily. I don't think they're on the story map yet. Okay. If you guys didn't hear that, uh, Kenzie helped design the um, the story map, and when you zoom in there, parcels do appear, so you can zoom in to see parcels. So thanks, Kenzie. Yeah, any question about the prioritization or the analyses? Yeah, absolutely. I might uh, pass the mic to you, Meg, to talk about winds and how that factors into fire behavior analysis. She's our expert here. The map that Karina showed of the Crown Fire activity, there was the 60th percentile and the 90th percentile condition, so that is um, 60th percentile means that only 40% of days during the typical fire season has more extreme conditions. So it's more like almost average kind of weather conditions and then 90th percentile is really extreme. So 60th percentile has higher fuel moisture and lower winds and then the 90th percentile had 
15 mile per hour, 20 foot winds, and we base that on um, actual data that's collected from remote automatic weather stations in the area, and you know, the distribution of winds, and then talking to Ben and John about what kind of wind conditions could create really concerning fire behavior. So the 60th percentile, which we base a lot of the prioritization on, is less extreme conditions, because if an area could support ground fire under higher fuel moisture and lower winds, that means it's really, really risky because it's not going to take you know, super extreme conditions like what we saw last year when we had really extreme fire behavior. So that's why we, we do multiple weather scenarios. Yeah, in front of there. Sort of along that line, I was uh, water damage in the factory. Yes. So, um, I think Meg was saying that the water availability factors into suppression challenges. Um, and so, there is there was some data on that, and then when they did the field tours, they were able to go and actually assess the validity of that data and make sure they had a good understanding of uh, the water resources throughout the district. So actually, a really, really thorough analysis of water resources was done. Um, and that factors into the suppression challenges. Yeah, in the back. Uh, yes, I think we came in a little bit late. Are you guys consultants to the fire? Yes. Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Yeah. And is this the first um, analysis like this that's ever been done in these, in these districts? Or were you working off of other material? Or this is all new? Yeah, so there, there are CWPPs from 2007, five. Seven? I'm getting both numbers. <laughs> um, one of the two. Uh, so so there, there was a CWPP that we, uh, there's been a lot of advancement in fire science since then, so we didn't really take a lot of information from those previous CWPPs, and we did, um, because there's been community growth, um, we did kind of redefine um, communities as these plan units because uh, the way that they were defined before wasn't as useful to the residents and to the fire protection district. So, well, no, great work. Anyway. <laughs> really good work. Oh, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question about the fire uh, protection district. Um, I know that the Here are omitted because they're in our residential lands. Um, but we did assess fire behavior for, for the whole district, including those areas. And um, it's a great way for me to preview and give you a sneak peek of what's going to happen at the end here. We're going to invite some of our partners to come up at the end. And so, Jefferson County Open Space, Denver Mountain Parks, um, Representative from Staunton State Park, U.S. Forest Service. All the public land managers participated in this process and um, are going to be working with the districts to move forward on fuel treatment. Okay, so that information has been passed to the appropriate. Yeah, program. yeah, and uh, yeah, they they are they've been great help, and we we thank them all for being a part of that project. Um, some folks are weren't able to make it, but they're actually on a Zoom up here. So at the end, if we have questions for um, then we can direct them their way. Um, and I'll say too that um, you guys are lucky to live in a community where these partners really like, they really want to get stuff done. It's really, really cool compared to some of the other places we work. So um, there's a lot of willingness, and that's a really perfect point to make that from the neighborhood and the individual resident level, it needs to come all the way up to kind of that bird's eye view, working with land managers, it has to be everybody. So yeah, I appreciate that. I think we'll move on here um, to the next piece, but we'll have time for more questions and if we don't mind cutting them off. Um, so now we're gonna talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about what you can do in general and run through some of the recommendations that we have for you if you're not familiar with home gardening and defensible space. And then um, we'll get some more in-depth information about local resources. I really wanted to kind of pull this up. This is one interpretation 
of the data where we can look at the dots in red um, are 11 or more homes that are within short range spotting distance. So that means they're within 100 meters of fuel that is likely to cause short range embers. Um, so within 100 meters of other homes that could oh. respond to their Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, my apologies. Poor explanation. So it's not within 100 meters of vegetation, 100 meters of another home um, that could cause um, fire behavior that could be creating home to home ignition conditions. So the, the purpose of talking about this and why home to home ignition is really important to have in your mind is if you mitigate your home, you're not only safer from embers that are created either from a neighboring home or neighboring vegetation, but you're also making other people in your community safer. So there's a lot of densely clustered homes in, this, in these two districts, and we want to make sure it's really clear that the more work that you do on your home, your property, in your playing unit, the, the better, uh, better off you are and the better off the whole community is. So can I get a show of hands? Who's heard of defensible space before? OK. Almost everybody. I saw only a few hands not up. Um, so I will just kind of run through this quickly then, since most of you are familiar. And if you are not as familiar, never fear. We have tons of guidance in the document. Um, and you can peruse it at your leisure. Um, what the really important fact I want to drive home here is defensible space can feel really overwhelming when you're taking a look at all these different actions and feeling like you don't know where to start. Um, we definitely recommend starting that first zone of your home um, that for the first 30 feet, that is a really important spot. Um, if you haven't done so, clean your gutters. Take one step in the right direction and the next step will feel easier and a little bit less daunting. Um, we're not only talking about uh, removing the fuels from around your home, but we're also, this, this is the older version of this graphic that I made, the State Forest Service updated their guidance and zone one is actually zero to five feet, zone two is five to 30, mm -hmm. and zone three is 30 to 100, and in the document it's the correct version. I'm sorry, I missed that when you went through the problem earlier. This is from before they updated the guidance. Gotcha, Did it, was everybody able to hear that? No, um, so we we missed the, we had, we pulled the an older version of this graphic in, so the current State Forest Service guidance has changed a little bit. There's a million copies of it at the back, so you can take it with you. Thank you, Emma, from the State Forest Service for bringing that. Um, but I guess the, the real point to drive home here is pick one of these actions on the screen and do it. You're going to be, each step that you take is going to be reducing your risk and you need to be working towards defensible space. You're not going to get it all done in one day, um, but taking some small steps around the base of your home, removing flammable material, making sure there's no um, cozy spot of pine needles on your roof or in your gutters for an ember to land. These are all things that are really important that not only protect your home, but your whole community. Um, along those same lines, Home hardening is really important because you're not just reducing the fuels around your home and the flammable material, but you're reducing the risk of an ember um, or radiant heat igniting your home. So if you have your defensible space going and you have clean gutters um, and you, you kind of removed material, you can still take in embers into vents and things like that. Um, so taking some steps on home hardening are really important. Um, again, my advice would be to take one step. Put some mesh over your vents. Take that step. You're going to be a little bit safer. Your home's going to be um, at reduced risk. Again, you and your community. That's really the message here is it's not just about individual home protection, but about reducing the risks throughout the community. And why we're talking about this is, again, this is the way that communities could look um, if we're living in a fire adapted landscape. So kind of pulling it back to that original slide. We want to be thinking about how a community or a plan unit can be expanding from one home of isolated defensible space 
to much safer with multiple homes with linked defensible space. That is really huge, especially in some of these communities that haven't done a lot of work before. Starting this process, doing a few things and getting down the road, that is what we need to be thinking about. I know that that feels really daunting, but we're going to pass it to um, Ben and John here to talk a little bit about what some of the local opportunities are to guide you through this process and what kind of local resources you have. This is the last slide that I have. Um, one thing I encounter a lot working in communities up here and along the range in general is not wanting to cut trees because it feels like they naturally belong here. Um, the forest on the right is actually the historical condition that we're, that these forests are supposed to be in. Um, we're looking at more spacing between trees. They would have had, they would have experienced frequent low intensity fires. And when fire came through, there's still trees, there's still a functional ecosystem at the end. When we're encouraging you to think about doing defensible space and getting started and cutting some of those trees that feel, you know, we're all, we all love trees, but it can almost feel a little bit emotional. I can understand that. But it's really important for you to think about an ecological forest that will still be there when the fire passes through. Um, and I, that's why I love this graphic, because no one wants to build their home back in that middle, or in that bottom land. That's not a fun place to be. So, let's talk about, oh, okay, sorry Ben and John, I was going to pass it to you, but I, I had some other slides that I forgot about. Um, so, in a moment, they will talk to you about what you can do, what resources are, um, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Um, some of you are probably familiar with this already. Ready, Set, Go is an evacuation preparedness program, being ready, preparing your home, defensible space, home hardening, being set, having a to-go bag, or a, a ready to-go bag. Does anyone have an evacuation bag? Okay. When you go home tonight, I would encourage you to compile some of your documents and place them in a bag and get that bag started. That's a great thing to have. Makes your evacuations a lot smoother if you are ready to go. Um, and then being ready, so when that go happens and you get that alert, you can get out the door and be safe. Um, I'll just plug here really quick, code red. How many of us have signed up for code red? Almost everyone. Really important that you're going to get that evacuation alert, that, that go. You need to be ready to know when that's going to be coming. Um, I encourage you, as maybe a holiday president to your local firefighters, Find five people and get them signed up for Code Red. That'd be great. Um, why this is all really important and why we're talking about evacuation is so the CWPP is not an evacuation plan, but it's, it comes up a lot. And so we wanted to have this ready to go to talk about it's really, really important while you're thinking about mitigation that you're also thinking about emergency preparedness. So these are some of the ideas. Don't be the person taking a picture of the fire and backing up a whole evacuation route. Um, there's going to be a lot of things going on during a potential evacuation. So make sure you're yielding to vehicles. Make sure you're listening to emergency responders, the sheriff's department. Um, just kind of want to make a plug there. This is not an evacuation plan, but when we go through these CWPP meetings, we often get a lot of evacuation questions. Okay. Now back to Ben and John to talk about what you have, what resources you have in the community to help you um, mitigate. Alrighty. Who here is familiar with the ambassador program that the district's up? Alright. I do know that we have a few ambassadors here and I thank you for coming. If you are not aware of the ambassador program, what we're trying to do, you saw the planning units up there, we're trying to have an ambassador, at least one representing each planning unit. And that is an extension, that person is an extension of the fire district to kind of streamline communications from the district to the community. So it's very hard unless folks are really engaged with, with what's going on and, and engaged with social media and they're getting emails from us and stuff, it's really hard to get the information out there. And we found that in the community, that grassroots kind of connection, people are much more in tune with what's going on. So the ambassadors are out there to 
bring you information. We, we offer some specific trainings for them that they can bring back to the community. And it, it just helps drive that community awareness and that education uh, there on that local level. If you do not, or excuse me, let me back up a little bit. If you are unaware if you have uh, an ambassador, go to the website. It's, it'll be on that story map. You can click on your planning unit, and if there's an ambassador that's already volunteered for that planning unit, you'll see their name on there, and it should have their email. You can reach out to them, get more information from them on how to become more engaged with the community, get information about events and stuff like that. If your community or planning unit does not have an ambassador, and you are willing to step up to the call, we would love for you to reach out to us. Um, it, it's, it's imperative for us to have that link, that communication between, between us and the residents. So um, do look into that. There's a lot of information on the website about the program. And um, hopefully in time, right now we're at about 25 ambassadors um, out of 46 planning units. So there's plenty of space out there for folks to, to get involved. If you're a planning unit, if you're in a group where there's not a lot, or if a large planning unit with not an ambassador, and you're thinking that's just too much for me to, to cover, talk to your neighbors, talk to somebody else, see if you get some other folks. We've got some larger planning units where there might be two ambassadors for that, for that unit. So don't let that scare you. Um, second program I'm going to talk about is our chipping program. Who participated in the chipping program last year? Awesome. So if you're not familiar with the chipping program, we open up signups at the, at the beginning of our early spring, uh, or late winter, early spring. And what that what happens is you sign up and you are then notified with a time frame that we will be in your community. And during that time frame, you can have your slash stacked out by the curb. We will uh, chip uh, the, the slash put out as long as it meets the specifications. That's, Post it on our website. We will come chip that material into a chip truck and take it away from your property and you will never see it again and it's a happy day because you guys get the feel good of getting some work done on your property. You get the feel good of not having to load it up on a trailer and bring it someplace else and you get the feel good for chips not being broadcast back onto your property. We will take care of, of the mess. The awesome thing about that is we have huge support from our board of directors uh, from both districts and uh, that cost of the program is actually covered on our budget so there is no cost for the residents that is something that we provide for for every resident in the community free of charge so do look for those signups and again if you're an ambassador uh, or if, if you have an ambassador in your community and you're in touch with them they get a heads up a week before we open up the general signups for that so that's one of those perks of having an ambassador in your community or possibly being an ambassador is that you guys kind of get this, this first cue on, on things like that. So signups open up to ambassadors first, and then boom, it opens up to the general public. So another perk to being an ambassador. But if you uh, have not participated in the chipping program in the past, I suggest you do. It's a great resource, again, with, with little effort for you to get the slash off of your property. Any questions about those two resources? All right, I'll turn it over then. Good evening, everyone, and thanks again for coming. Uh, I'm going to take the other two, which is the wildfire suppression module, fuels crew, and the wildfire repair program. So um, we've really grown over the past four years within Elk Creek uh, alongside Air King. The suppression module actually started with just the chipping program. Uh, our crew lead, Jason Patton, has really has pushed that program hard, and now we have more permanent employees um, just on the suppression module side. So that crew is kind of turning a corner and specializing in a lot of the landscape scale mitigation projects that we've done. Also on the website, if you're interested in where they're working, we're going to get better at that um, with outreach um, and really on the website of what those projects are, where they are, and why we're doing them. Uh, but that does take time. And we're getting more capacity to be able to kind of interpret what the work we're doing is on that landscape level. The fuel screw is new this year, and that's with Inner Canyon. Um, they were really focused on the chipping program, but their programs are also going to increase 
um, providing more value for the, the buck that we have with the personnel. Um, they do all do suppression. So in combined in total, we do have 16 people during the summer season that specialize in wildland fire. A good example of that is uh, this last weekend, all of the permanents were out there, but a lot of the ground, as you guys know, is pretty inaccessible. Those guys specialize in the really steep, inaccessible ground. Um, it takes a lot of skill, it takes a lot of effort to get good at that type of firefighting, and that's what we're trying to bring and keep here uh, within the combined districts. The Wildfire Prepared Program, there's uh, pamphlets out there if you don't know what that program is, but as you saw a little bit, even with the experts, Defensible space is confusing, right? Um, sometimes you don't know what to do or where to start. Kelly here, our new wildfire mitigation specialist, um, is really the point person for the wildfire prepared program. What that is, is you sign up, she comes out, and she does a whole assessment for your home and defensible space, and it gives you a work plan uh, to move forward. We understand that it's an expensive, time-intensive process in some cases, um, so we give you that work plan over the long period of time and we're trying to build value within that defensible space so we've modeled a lot of our programs off of what we've seen in the state including Boulder County wildfire partners um, so we're trying to bring that value of actually doing the certificate if you do everything that Kelly tells you you can get a certificate of mitigation and then we're trying to really develop the value based on real estate so we're trading realtors every year and they can you can put that certificate on the MLS listing as something that is a value added to the home and we are working with our insurance companies insurance companies know this is a high risk area but what we're trying to do is kind of bring that standard so they can follow us and use that certificate as okay you do have defensible space so I just want to thank you as well um, a lot of this implementation and ability to create these projects were due to um, excuse me, the ballot initiative uh, through Elk Creek, and then the chiefs are going to talk about how we're going to try and increase capacity moving forward. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So, we only get a couple minutes, which is kind of sad because we had a whole thing planned out, but <laughs> that's all right. First, we're really, we're really lucky. Uh, we have you know, partnered with Ember Alliance and Maggie and Karina because they're extremely brilliant people. So their expertise and what they brought to this project has been, it's been amazing for us. And Captains Mandel and uh, Yellen have put in hours. Chief Ware and I are so grateful to the effort and dedication that those two have to this project and to the community. So. Um, thank you guys for Ember Lions for all you've done. Quick question. Oh, yes. <laughs> Quick question. We're going to briefly talk to you a little bit about what we're doing together and some return. Who here has heard that Elk Creek and Inner Canyon are looking at and considering consolidation? Oh, good. Wow, that was more than I thought. Excellent. Um, so, as we know, as hopefully you know, we are mainly volunteer departments. Elk Creek has a few more career personnel in Inner Canyon, but we're mainly volunteer departments. And you also might know that volunteerism in our area, as well as the whole nation, is declining. It's declining at a rapid pace. And that's at the same time that calls are increasing, and those the acuity of those calls are going up, meaning they're more complex, they take a lot longer, they take more personnel. So we're hitting a critical mass point where we're running out of volunteers at a time when our calls are increasing. And so we have, we're have we basically trying to get ahead of that curve. We want to be in front of the problem that we're facing. So it's one of the main reasons that Chief Ware and myself have begun those talks to look at what it would be to be a single district, that 152 square miles that you're looking at and how we function together. I know Chief Ware is uh, going to take a little bit more First. All right. Well, so, kind of, that was a good segue. I got a lot of questions is why do we do this together? Um, and that, that's a great question. So, we we work together as agencies. We have probably as long as both agencies have been together, you know, in existence. 
neither one of us have enough staffing to handle the amount of calls we have for the large scale calls. On that little fire that went on this weekend on Sunday, I, I think we had nine agencies and hit the peak probably 45 people. That's what it takes for a 12 acre fire. Now extrapolate that out into a larger scale fire. So we work together all the time, and this, this wildland division that we kind of created, we kind of came up with, it was, we started talking about it, we both had to do these projects, and we were looking at the economy of scale, if you will, because if we were to do them individually, it would cost maybe a little bit less, but we both, both agencies would be spending essentially the same amount of money. So she sure when I sat around and was like, well, why, why don't we do this together? What are the cons? And we couldn't really come up with any. And so we started growing all these projects, Wildland Division, and then the CWPP, and all of them, they worked out really well. And I, I feel like, you know, moving forward, we're going to keep growing all of these projects together. And the whole idea is to provide a better service. The whole idea of CWPP is to provide actionable data for the residents. You know, this is a forward-facing document. We want everybody to have it. That's why we're kind of forcing everybody to scan that QR code. Everybody needs to look at it. We don't want to keep this kind of rat hole buried in our website. We really want this out everywhere because that's what's going to give people the actionable data to help do mitigation products, projects, to help lessen the fire risk. And doing it between the two districts, it just made sense because I mean, we have, for instance, where Chief Sherlock lives on Hillview, one side of the road is Inner Canyon, one side of the road is Elk Creek, literally. There's no reason we shouldn't operate together more. So that's kind of why we ended up doing this together. We started pushing all of these projects together and ultimately moving forward, we're gonna start doing a lot more together and hopefully in the future, we're going to become one. That, that's the goal of this. The success of what we've done the last year and a half has kind of proven it. It really makes sense. So that, that's what we've been working on and that's what we're gonna keep driving into the future. So that's about all we have. We only got about five minutes and then they're gonna get back up and probably do better stuff. Oh. <laughs> a little dancing, maybe. Uh, so uh, they will be available for, for questions. We're going to, at this point, pull everyone up onto the stage that was a partner on this project. So Jefferson County Emergency Management, the land managers, you, you guys are kind of scattered about it. I can't quite point to all of you. but. We're going to now have some time for questions, and I'm going to ask everyone to come up to the stage so I can pass you guys the mic as the questions appear. I see a question from you, ma'am. and potential for the, the districts to be um, applying for grant funding to pass on to the uh, homeowners. So thanks for that question. Um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to capture the complexities of that question uh, fully because the, the funding landscape is quite complicated and you know the fires from last year in Colorado, the fires in California, a lot of these are competing for those same resources. Um, but as Karina mentioned earlier, we are one of the highest risk communities in the state. So people are looking to us uh, potentially for that funding. One of the reasons why this plan is so important is because some of that grant funding requires plans like this in order to get that funding. So we need to finalize this plan, number one, and then be able to be ready for some of that. Um, we do have, we operate a lot on grants, so it's not like all of the programs that we've done so far is just out of our pockets. 
a significant portion of our time is grant writing, um, which is good and bad at the same time, right? Uh, we're spending a lot of that time, sometimes we don't get them, um, so that it's uh, maybe a little bit of time wasted if you want to look at it that way. So uh, we are ramping up to try and align ourselves with some of that. Um, as our partners are in the room, um, we do work at the Upper South Platte Partnership as well, so a lot of landscape scale um, organizations, including Denver Water and all those guys, have really supported our programs as well. So even if we don't get infrastructure funding, we've got to diversify our, our grant abilities and grant writing abilities and funding pools to keep some of this mitigation going. As an example, uh, we did get some firm, which is uh, Colorado State Forest Service funding for defensible space. Uh, Kings Valley, in your neck of the woods, you know, has a lot of that overlapping defensible space, but a lot of that funding doesn't cover the cost of structural mitigation, right? It's a lot of defensible space focused money where they won't necessarily touch your home. So it's, it's um, kind of that dichotomy of waiting for funding and uh, not waiting for funding. What I would say is don't wait for funding. Um, it's not always a guarantee and it's not guaranteed to you. So looking to change your wildfire risk, I would say get started, like Karina said, clean those gutters out, change those vents, get Kelly out to your, to your neighborhood. Um, and then if we do get funding, we're much more ready for that. How do, how do you find out whether or not you have access, you have the possibility of getting some grant money for your own situation as a homeowner? Is that some part of madness? Yeah. Uh, so, sorry. Okay. No, my uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, a lot of what we presented tonight is, is part of that prioritization, right? Yep. We have limited funds. We have limited capabilities really to implement a lot of the work. This is a 152 square mile area. Um, not everybody's gonna get that money. So it really is gonna be based on some of the risk assessment that we've had done here. Um, if we do get money moving forward, we're gonna make that um, very clear of who's, who's ready for it, who has the ability to get that. Um, a lot of the funding that we've looked at recently is for defensible space, but we also got funding for a new chipper for the, the um, chipping crew, right? And so indirectly you are taking advantage of some of that if you are signing up for the chipping program. So um, kind of a double-headed question there. Did that answer your question? Sure. Okay. In your rally, did you identify areas that were possibly refuge areas in terms of the turnover for people to Congregating in such as the uh, Safeway uh, Center, a uh, parking lot, or a football field at the front of high school, or even the athletic field out here at this school, where there's, and that's a refuge space yeah. as opposed to a defensible space. Yeah, so um, we did not assess uh, temporary areas of refuge. Um, there what I can what I can tell you is there aren't a lot of great places in this community. You mentioned a few of the potential options, um, but there the the difficulty that we've had, and so you you maybe have seen that we've done that in other communities um, like Evergreen. The CWPP did include an assessment of that, and what it what we can really do is identify areas for treatment to become temporary areas of refuge, but we have found that that's been a real difficult um, place to go. So um, I don't know if you guys have had anything you wanted to add there, but there are some places in town where people could congregate, but I think um, maybe, I don't know, Hal or the Chiefs, if you wanted to add anything about kind of how evacuations might be managed and how those spaces might be used. I can touch on that. So identifying something as a temporary area of refuge on our mapping, there's a lot more to it than just identifying it as that area of refuge. If we call somebody's private land an area of refuge on that, on a map, we have to have a land use agreement in place with that property owner. 
different. That property owner has to sign a contract. So if the county, the sheriff, we get together, we call for an evacuation, and everybody says go to X, and it turns out to be Billy's pasture. Everybody goes to Billy's pasture. Everybody tears up Billy's pasture. The fire doesn't come through there. Everybody leaves. We're responsible for Billy's pasture. We didn't have a land use agreement. There have been a lot of instances in California where emergency managers have sent people to a place, and however altruistic it is on the front end, on the back end, people are very not happy when their land is destroyed, when there's a lot of damage done to it by the people evacuating. And that, that sounds like an awful thing. And in the heat of the moment, I think it, it would probably work, but to identify it here as an air refuge, the other thing is to identify something, the Safeway parking lot. Uh, during some of the fires in California, the Camp Fire, for instance, there were a number of Safeway parking lots that became foundations. A lot of these places, it's only an area of refuge depending on the fire behavior. Uh, a number of the fires in Napa, um, there were strip malls, YMCAs, a lot of places that were originally, that they were identified as a safety zone per se, that were not safety zones based on the fire behavior. So it, it's very complicated to call something a uh, temporary refuge, a safety zone, without knowing what kind of fire behavior is going to impact that area. And while it's not ideal to make a spur of the moment decision on that, what we talked about during this when we were talking about the underlines is, I don't want to put something like that on the map. Emergency managers end up using that, and we do have, heaven forbid, a catastrophic event like the campfire. Everybody's read this map, everybody's seen the Safeway parking lot, for instance. People go there. It becomes very complicated very quickly. So no, we did not identify areas of refuge or temporary safety zones, anything that, along that line, just because of because of those reasons. Did that answer your question, Neil? What's the optimum percentage that you and the chick consider what a fire is for action? A plan unit uh, applying independently for a grant? You're right. Um, I think, I guess that's kind of a tough question. Yeah, it's, it's, I know, I worked in government for years, and I know there's a, a great opportunity to become available people that sometimes contribute more matching funds uh, have a better chance of getting the grant, right? So, have you guys seen a switch off or anything like that? Generally, that's one aspect of the grant. Um, I would say I haven't found a sweet spot for a general rule, more the better. Um, they're looking to match their funds as well to the best of their ability. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, anybody else in the room that specializes in grants. Uh, they're looking more for collaboration these days. Um, we do have a lot of that going on in this room already, um, especially within the Upper South Platte watershed uh, with all of our partners. So that's something that we have going for us. As a planning unit, um, I would encourage you to work with Kelly as the community ambassador um, liaison there, and then we can move forward with that. There are some sideboards and guidelines that we don't necessarily need to get into now, but if you wanted to um, have a chat, we can certainly do that. Um, it becomes very complicated um, when we're talking about planning unit grants versus fire protection district grants because it's based on resources people, time, and money, and depending on if you're asking us to do it for private contractors, all those things. So um, again, grants can be very complicated. So I would say, if you're thinking about something like that, come to us first, um, and we can move forward from there. Kelsey, do you have any more insights about like, grants managed through the State Forest Service? Uh, Hi everyone, I'm Kelsey, I'm from the Colorado State Board of Service. I work for the Boulder Field Office. Why don't you guys come up to the front? Oh.
Hi, um, I'm Emma Brokel. I'm a forester with the Colorado State Forest Service in the Golden Field Office. Um, I work with Inner Canyon and Elk Creek a lot. So uh, I, I do want to say you guys are doing an awesome job. I read a lot of CWP keys. I review, review a lot, and it is very rare to have such involvement um, by the fire protection districts, by the agency that's writing them. Uh, this is a great collaboration, so I, I do want to applaud all of you. alluded to, they are quite complicated. There is no cookie cutter um, sweet spot, as you said. Uh, I will say there's no percentage of homes or people involved that we would like to see in grants, but I would say the more the better. Don't apply to a grant without talking to your fire protection district first. Definitely do not do that. Uh, collaboration, as Ben said, is key. Um, different kinds of, I guess, treatments or different kinds of collaborations. Like if you can work cross boundaries with different communities or different plan units. Um, as far as match, I will say 50% from the landowners is usually how it goes. The more, not necessarily the better, but Collaboration, talk to your landowner, talk to your neighbors, get more landowners on board. You'll talk to me, um, shoot me an email, we can talk about it as well, but I will say go direct with uh, Ben and John first, or your community ambassador, go through the proper avenues. Uh, I guess that's, that's my spiel. <laughs> I'll say too, I'm going to put somebody else on the spot and say the Jefferson Conservation District also does some work with private land. Um, so maybe you can talk about what you guys do. Sure. Hi everyone. My name is Matt McLemore with Jefferson Conservation District. I'm a forester. And like Karina said, we partner with private landowners to implement a larger scale forest restoration treatments on their properties. So typically those are 40 acres and up. Um, and we, we oftentimes help people find funding to do those projects. Um, and we, we really, you know, just to echo what everyone else has said, there, there's a ton of investment from all these partners in, in this area. And, you know, I don't think anyone's really mentioned this yet, but the reason that we're all up on the stage is because we, we really care about this problem. Uh, and, you know, those, those maps are scary. <laughs> there's no getting around that. Um, but the, the key is that we all have to work together um, and work across boundaries, and we can we can find solutions to this problem um, and continue living in a, in a healthy ecosystem. So, yeah, next. I'll take questions too if anyone has any. Yeah, we have a question. Yeah, we have a question. Even the US ID. In the zero to five foot zone. How do you do that in terms of material? Some of what is great about the error of grows up to be pretty high. If there are landscaping material that is not normal that stops the weed growth, or I was thinking about getting sort of sheet rock or a fiber cement board or something and laying it down, is there, and it would also be of use to the community to have an area that's treated properly. And where there's a lot of foot traffic, like front of high school or somewhere in some of these shopping centers, to say, here's how you do this, and here's the materials. And especially if you don't have a big pickup truck and you have a sedan or an SUV, what kinds of materials can you pack up from Home Depot or uh, as the car hardware and produce the zero to five foot zone? How do you engineer it and how the photographs? So when it comes to that zero to five foot zone, we're really looking for non-combustible. So um, you have a lot of options. A lot of people usually think of something xeric, so putting down like a weed matting. That way, you're eliminating vegetation from coming through. Is that burn? I haven't found any that's not burn. 
It is, but if you are placing things over top of it, you're really um, minimizing really what that's going to actually do, the intensity of it, how it's actually going to burn, what it's actually going to affect. So with that weed matting, that's going to keep down any vegetation and then putting rock over top of it. Something about like a three-quarter inch rock is usually preferable. And the reason for that is you want to have something that is big enough that you can get leaf litter or needle litter off of it by easily leaf blowing, but then also you want something that's not going to collect too much um, litter on it as well. So as far as like what homeowners can do, you know, obviously moving rock is kind of it's a lot of work, but having it delivered to the property and then just you know working around is kind of part of that landscaping. You can also do pavers. That's a really great option as well. Just kind of treat that like a pathway around the home. Um, what was the second part of your question? Um, fiber cement board. Fiber cement board. As far as having that on the ground, I mean, appeal-wise, I don't know if that would necessarily look great, um, but I mean, it is a non-combustible option, so you could do that, to scrape that ground down to um, kind of bare mineral soil and make something like that over top. I think something that would look more aesthetically pleasing would be like a paver stone or some form of rock, that way you have a good look to it as well. So how are we going from this to some yeah, great question. Um, so one thing I just want to catch real quick, we are not identifying or predicting or suggesting evacuation routes. That's not our job. That also the county, and if they want to talk about that, they can, but um, as far as how we get prepared there on plan unit recommendations and what individual homeowners can do, um, like we were mentioning, each plan unit comes with a summary of fire behavior, a summary of hazardous conditions, the reason for that rating, and then the top actions to be taken in that area. And then within the actual document itself is an incredible amount of detail um, about how to and where to start and maybe some low cost options and some of the kind of problem solving around that. So when we're talking about an individual plan unit, you'll get um, the rating, fire behavior summary, um, the description of the risk, and then top actions to mitigate that risk for that plan unit. And where is that? So that is going to, the um, story map will have a link to that and then the CWPP will have even greater depth about that. Um, so the CWPP will be available to you in January, and in the meantime, the story map will be available to you to start to identify where you are, and more information will be coming on as um, there is time for it to be uploaded. Did you guys want to add anything to that question? So to tack on to that, um, one of the reasons for the ambassador program is to have that person in the community that can then drive and spearhead some of the projects that may take place in the community. So having a, an engaged ambassador that is familiar with the CWPP, that is familiar with their planning unit, that is familiar with what is recognized or identified as the hazards that, that are top priority to be mitigated in that community, they're the ones that can take that information back and so-called rally the troops and start getting work done on the ground in your community. Um, community. So again, that's that's that resource from the district that you know. If you have an, an ambassador, please engage them. If you do not have an ambassador, please consider being one. Um, and and that's kind of how that trickle down takes place. We cannot go into every community and sit down with everybody individually and start making plans. We don't have the capacity to do that. So empowering the community with an ambassador to kind of start getting those wheels turning, we will definitely come in and assist. But it, it's the district is too large for us to be doing that with with every individual community on our own. Is that all? Uh, that's not answering the question. Uh, the CWPP, they're a lottery for the states. You don't have public input, like meetings like this. And all these people here are interested. I want to see what it says so we can comment on it before it's done. It's not accurate. So we have to be able to do that. Yeah, and I think that's 
to comment. Uh, we will have a feedback form. I think that comes with the CWP. So, so when the when the document um, is is released, we will have an opportunity for everyone to provide feedback. This is kind of our last stage before we can feel like we can finalize. We want to talk to everyone first. So uh, we wanted to see what types of questions came up and make sure that any answers to those were appropriately reflected. And then there will be an opportunity for feedback when you get to go through the document itself. And you can um, provide feedback at that time. And if we need to make changes, we will make changes to address those comments. And um, it will be between us and the Fire Protection District to kind of determine when, when those comments have been addressed. And that would be the, the method of incorporating that. But unfortunately, it is a, a giant um, document, so we wanted to today provide some context so that when you're able to see that information, you know what you're looking at, you know what to be expecting, and hopefully it's been a little bit of a teaser and will get you excited to read it um, because a lot of work has gone into it and we think it's really high quality, but um, it takes it takes some, some interest from you all to, to want to go out and seek that information out. So part of the purpose here is not only to see what kind of questions you all have for us, but also to um, you know, hopefully entice you to follow the um, story map and website and be ready to digest and read the CWPP um, when we have a version that can be released to all of you. Oh my, I didn't see the point up first. Uh, we only live at the same time. <laughs> okay, I missed it, I can't see the light. So, I'm an ambassador of the Eagle uh, District. And Ben, I think the last time you and I talked, you weren't a captain, so congratulations. I guess it's um, Thank you for all the work you all have been doing. I know that it is an awful lot, there's a lot to digest. Um, what form, when you finally get it done, is this going to be released to the public uh, so that I can make it easier for monitor, tell my people where to go see it and so forth? Um, yeah, I, maybe I'll have you kind of talk a little bit more detail about the website and all of that. Um, but So if you hit either Inner Canyon's website or Elk Creek's website, uh, Elk Creek Fire.org, Inner Canyon Fire.org, you'll see a, a link for Wildland. Click on that, that brings you to the Wildland Division page. It's the same, both districts, we are one Wildland Division. On there, you can go to Programs and you'll see links on the bottom. Currently, the link is to our current CWPP, which is the 2005-2007 one. Um, but that will then reflect the new PDF of the new version. It's also, as required, this is a, a state-driven uh, document so that the State Forest Service actually signs off on this document. It's also hosted on their website. If you go to the State Forest Service website right now and search CWPPs, uh, you'll see lists of counties. You can click on Jefferson County. You'll see our current ones there right now. So it will be accessible through both of those means and it is PDF version. So you can download it, put it on your bedside table right before you get that. <laughs> Uh, intercanyonfire.org, and then click on the Wildland tab up top, okay. and it'll take you to the Wildland Division website, and then you'll see uh, different links up top, all the programs are there, but if you go to the program, what, what's the link where the, I'm trying to draw a blank on the menu, yeah, uh, planning. planning, it's the planning tab up top, and that'll bring you to the CWPP. Gotcha. Okay. We're going to pull it up in the background here. Okay. I've got a question. Regarding the uh, mitigation along uh, potential evacuation routes, there are right of ways along the roads. And will the treatment of the mitigation within a right of way be the responsibility of the property owner, or will that be the responsibility of the county or the fire department in terms of funding? And then what happens if the mitigation was you've got a right of way of 20 feet? Or that's a fantastic but question. The thing is, certainly they can come in and say, well, there's a right way, and we got that, we'll just cut that down, because this is right way, and it's just a purpose and, and control of that. So, number one, who pays for that, and who doesn't, 
And then number two, get the right of way to 100 feet, your house is 100 feet. So there will you'll be coming down through to your front porch. So, uh, and plus, how do you know where the right of way is in terms of when you survey all the survey camps along the edge of the road or something that was 50 years ago? And who goes establishing where the right of way stands? And how does that pay for in terms of the actual practicality from the abstract into the now we've got a problem. Here's the road, here's the survey pins, here's the right of way, who pays for it, et cetera, et cetera. Has anybody actually thought about turning these greens into reality and the front work on the ground in terms of mitigating all these areas that have been determined as high priority? How do you do it? Here's the crew out here, here's the survey, so forth and so on. Okay, so we did have Rotor Bridge involved in our discussions and our meetings. Um, they are technically responsible for the, the right of way on the roadside. They do not have the capacity or funding to do any of that. I know we've heard from residents in the past that, you know, I can't cut the trees or the shrubs or anything on that right of way because that's not my property, that's the county property. I have gotten in writing in an email from the county saying that. If you want to cut anything adjacent to the road that's part of your property there, you are welcome to do that. Nobody has the funding to just come out and start doing roadway mitigation. It, it, it's, it, it's right now falling to the homeowner who has that property that, that is adjacent to that roadway to mitigate that as a simple answer. Excuse me, this uh, mask is getting to me a little bit. Um, you're touching on a, a very hard subject for fire mitigation. One of the reasons why we're at such high risk is because of the density that we have within the conifer area. So um, the outline that they had for overlapping home ignition zones um, is pretty accurate for most of the area here. That does include roadways. So um, I think you're hitting on the topic of this is a complicated issue, but it's also a social issue. It's not just a forest issue, right? We can't force anybody to mitigate their property, so we're going to go to the people who want to mitigate their property, first off and first foremost. And then we're going to work with the people around them to try and get those implemented. It takes a lot of time and planning to get these projects done. We've been successful in the past with the fuels crew and the module um, in areas that have put forth the effort to come to the table and plan with us, but there's issues all over the place in terms of private road access, and um, we can throw out a list of things that complicate these factors, which is why fire and African communities and wildland urban interface mitigation is one of the harder things to do, um, in my opinion. So. You're hitting on a lot of those topics, but those are the topics that we have to address to implement them. Um, and we are have done and are currently in the process of doing that. Um, and if you want to talk about like specifics, we can certainly talk about that at a later date if you want to. Yeah, hey, evening, everyone. Everyone keeps pointing at me, so I figure I'd say hello. Um, <laughs> My name is Hal Green, I'm the Emergency Management Director for Jefferson County. Uh, I work within the Sheriff's Office, but I, I, I'm, you know, I, I steward the statutory authority for, for the Sheriff's Responsibility for the Fire Warden, but then Comprehensive Emergency Management through the VCC, so I have kind of my, my feet in both, both areas. And more importantly, I'm a neighbor. I live in uh, Pine Junction myself, so I'm in the Will-O-Wisp plan. Uh, what is it called? Planning, planning unit. So, so I'm on the map to doing this. And, and has anyone got the, the, the wildfire assessment? I did that. And I, I just moved here a few months ago, and, uh, and that's the first thing I did. Is I, I want to try to lead by example. And so I did that, and it was it was mind blowing. And I spent some money to cut. I've cut four trees down already, so I'm already on the up. So, so I'm trying to, to do my part too. Uh, and, and I just wanted to, to say hello and. And it's all kind of higher level of the county. There's a couple of things because you know, right now we're talking wildfire, wildfire mitigation. Um, you know, I deal with all hazards, so we're part of um, 
all hazard mitigation as well. And I just wanted to share with anyone read the all hazard mitigation plan. We just finished, got a couple. Of them. Good. Uh, Tolstoy has nothing on hazard mitigation. <laughs> It's a very thick document, um, but it's a really important. It's one thing I did want to kind of feature because everybody here was, was part of that as well. And, and wildland fire is, is obviously a very big threat, but more importantly, we have a lot of hazards in Jefferson County. And one of the things we're doing, especially with grants, especially with trying to, to share a collective knowledge base with all the agencies that have mitigation responsibilities. Uh, I want to be, I'm going to share this with y'all. I'm really proud to share that Jefferson County is the first county in the state of Colorado to have an official all-hazard mitigation advisory committee stood up and reportable to the BCC. We just did that this year. So we are taking mitigation of all hazard very seriously. And it takes a lot to get these projects stewarded. It takes the greatest good for the greatest number for most of these projects because as we've seen nationally, disasters are getting more and more expensive. So the dollar is being clamored for by more and more people. So while I would love to give each one of our households money, it is hard when we're scra scraping at every project grant that we can and trying to give it to the governmental agencies. So as you identify projects, the best way to, to steward any type of, of hazard mitigation project, whether it's wildland fire, it's drought, it's irrigation, it's flooding, is to bring it to one of the special districts or governmental organizations as a project and let them lift that up to the All-Hazard Mitigation Advisory Committee. That is the sounding board and the subject matter expertise that will be leveraged as a county to, to go for those break grants, to go for those, those mitigation grants. Um, so because it is complex and it's my job to work with our special districts and our jurisdictions to uncomplicate the already complex. And I have no grant writers. I've got two emergency managers. I have one fire management officer to help steward our, our issues with 13 fire districts. Not, they're not the issue, but the, the wildland fire issue and all the other things. So I just wanted to say hello and then bring up any questions y'all have. Y'all might have for me. I'm not a sworn officer, but I, I do work with a couple. Um, so if y'all have questions about Anything within the all hazard comprehensive emergency management that we do as a county, uh, I'm here as well. And again, I'm my neighbor, so I just want to say howdy. Any questions? Yes, ma'am. Your name again? My name is Hal Grieve, and I just moved here from Florida. Native Texan, but I, I, was, uh, I was a director of the Lashley County in Florida. We did have wildland fires, but hurricanes were predominantly uh, our big thing. But uh, yeah. So excited to be here, we love it here. And I moved right to the heart of the problem too, so I'm guilty as charged, so I'm right there with you. And again, I want to be part of the solution. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is more um, about the We can't say one way or another what's going to be funded, the percentage of how it's going to be funded until we see the specific grant, what the sideboards are. You know, some of the grants we don't go for because we can't increase our capacity right now without increasing our staff. But if the sideboards on the grant don't allow us to hire people, we can't do the work to do it. So a lot of it's very grant dependent. This is the first step to identify the problem areas figure out what the problem is, how the problem can be mitigated, and then we're going to look at the funding. We don't have the money to fund all these projects, but as, as grants come up, we are going to do everything we can. Um, Captain Yellen, Captain Handel, they're all over. We do have a handful of turnkey grants that we can insert into a number of these projects as they come available. 
But we, we can't give you a good answer, unfortunately. I wish we could. If we, had, if we could print money, we would get most of them done. But we, we operate on a very finite budget with this stuff, but we are very aware of it. Does that, does that kind of answer your question? I guess it's not an answer, but it, it kind of explains what we're trying to do. And is this going to last for five years or ten years? So, this one is a living document. We're, the goal is to update this every five years. We were very deficient in it last time. Our old CWPP sat for a long time. Everything has changed about it. If you get on the website and look at our old CWPP, it was great for what it was at the time, but there have been a tremendous amount of fires, science, studies, forest science. Everything has changed since those. The goal is now with these, with the leadership we have, we have in place with our districts, we're going to try and keep these constantly updated so we can have more modern science, so we're not looking at an antiquated document in 10 years that is not applicable to what we're living in right now. So the goal is five years. Is that good? Can I ask that? You guys are going to have a program of projects that you're going to have ready or think about getting some of it? Correct, yeah. We, we pretty much always have a small kitty of projects that if a grant comes up, a lot of them, their windows are very small into when you know you can apply for them. Sometimes they have a week's worth of opening. And when that happens, not a lot of us sleep. We try and put everything together. We tailor that project for that grant and try and get that turned in. So yeah, we do have a small amount of shell-ready projects that we can put on a landscape you know, anywhere within the district as long as it fits the side parts of that grant. And we're going to continue to develop those as, as things move forward. So I think um, in the interest of time, um, I think some of us will be hanging out and there might be some more opportunity for questions. But I wanted to kind of highlight where a lot of these questions are going is um, these are priorities to try to reduce the, the burden to try to figure out these next steps. But we can't necessarily say like this is where we're going to work because that requires a lot of work that's going to happen and I think it's really important to mention that um, you have an amazing group of folks here that are working for you at your fire protection districts and they're going to do everything they can to move these things forward but it's hard to say which one but hopefully it will be really easy to take priorities forward when we know what they are and so the if you take away one of these takeaways is that things need to happen at all scales. So you, the individual, the property owner, then going up into that neighborhood, that plan unit scale, thinking about land managers who are here and want to do this work with you and want to do it in coordination, and then at that fire protection district scale. So it has to happen at all levels. It can't just be these guys working on some of those priority landscapes and roadways that we share because we don't know exactly how that's gonna fall out but we need to be taking action on these priority items. Um, so I think I'll hand it over to one of the chiefs and um, we'll wrap it up there and we'll be around, but thank you so much for coming out. Uh, looks like we're over time, we'll be very brief. Uh, all I want to say is um, this is the, the first step. We know what our goal is, it's to become a safer community. The road there is very long, it's going to take a lot of hard work, and it's going to take all of us together to do that. All you have on stage are people who care deeply about this community. Most of us up here live in this community, we raised our kids here, we've gone to this school. We care immensely about this, and we're affected by the same risks that you are. So this is a step, this is our chance, and our biggest tool that we have is education to you, it's that communication with you, it's that relationship that we have with you. And we love the passionate questions because that means you care just as much about it as we do. So hopefully as we work together, we're gonna to start down this path, we're gonna start heading towards the answer. It's gonna be hard work, but we're gonna do it together. And one last thing, like I said, this is a forward-facing document. This document is to provide actionable data. We need feedback from you as the taxpayers and the residents of our districts. Come to our board meetings. Yale Creek board meeting, second Thursday, six o'clock, station one. Please come to the board meeting. Give us the feedback. If, if we don't get your feedback, we won't be able to keep growing this document. The goal is to have this as a living document, keep updating it. What we're, the goal is to never 
get into the same trap as we had before where we had an antiquated document that really wasn't applicable. And that relies a lot on you guys as a residents of the district. Thanks again for coming out. It's, it's very exciting to have people here. It's very exciting to have people asking great questions. Continue to ask those questions. Check out the story map. Once the final document rolls out, you can put it by your bedside and read it. it it'll be too late. It's a lot. Um, take the time, digest it, ask questions, give us your feedback. That's what's going to make it better, and that's what's really going to fine tune that actionable data for all of our residents. Thanks again, everybody. We'll be here for questions. Yeah, yeah. ask questions. We're here. Come on, come on.